Happy Constitution Day. I'm sure you've heard that a million times today, but it is a fantastic day to celebrate, and we are so honored that you all chose to come here. I know the beginning of school can be really tricky for a lot of your teachers and your parents, so let's give a moment to the teachers in the room and say thank you very much for taking us here. <laughs> we really appreciate it. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer here at the National Constitution Center, and I have a great job today. I get to be a part of this huge celebration, and I get to introduce one of my favorite authors. The woman that you're about to meet, I lovingly refer to as Constitution Lady, and a lot of other people do as well. And you can follow her on Twitter, and she has amazing stories on Twitter. What I love about her, she's like the trifecta of constitutional education. She is a constitutional lawyer, constitutional scholar, she is a journalist, and an award-winning book author. The book that you will get at the end is one of her books, and just to be really clear, this book is endorsed by so many people as well as ours, and this was the first book I was handed 12 years ago when I walked into this building and started working here, and it is still the exact one that sits on the edge of my desk, and every time I wanna dive into that part of constitutional history, that I'm hearing about in the news today, or that I find it affects my life, I go to that book first. Because what she does that I love the most, she doesn't just tell you the law, she tells you all about the people around the law. And that's what matters to me. I don't wanna know just about this one court case, I wanna know who those people are. How did they get to that point? And what did they do, and how does that affect my life today? So, Linda Monk is a brilliant scholar, a brilliant journalist, and the Constitution Lady, can we please all give her a big round of applause. Okay, are you ready to do some constitutional karaoke? Yes! Okay, so here's what I need. People who are in drama, people who are in glee club, people who do a really good headbanger, and I need some air guitar, and then there's gonna be a bass solo. So as the spirit moves you, join in. Uh, this is a specially commissioned piece by a middle school teacher who has his own band, and his students are featured in this. They're grown-ups now, but it's called talking about my constitution. And I think if we put it together, we can get it really hard for two minutes, all right? You ready? And when I point like this, you're gonna go listen to me. Talking about my constitution, talking about my constitution. All right, you ready? All right, we're going live. And this is a shout out to Mr. Turning Nevada Teacher of the Year and his base. And, come on girl, come on, I want some talk. Talking about my constitution, it's been around. Talking about my constitution, doing bold. Talking about my constitution, truth that'll never get old. Talking about my constitution, here we go, air guitar. Talking about my constitution. Talking about my constitution. That's confusion. Talking about my constitution. U.S. Constitution. Talking about my constitution. Face. Talking about my constitution. Oh. Talking about my constitution. Cause confusion. Talking about my constitution. Yes, constitution. Talking about my constitution. No constitution. Talking about my constitution. 
constitution, about my constitution. to classrooms all across America. So you just gave them a good wake up call. And for those of you who have not already noticed, what's, what's up? What's up? It's the preamble. Okay, now I've got our energy's high and we're gonna be mindful and bring it back to the center. Thank you, Grasshopper. It's the preamble. What does it also show? How is the preamble formed? By the license plates of 50 states. So if you have 50 states that come together in one government, what do we normally call that? Federalism. <laughs> Federalism. It's in the book that you'll get at the end. We recognize this picture too, don't we? Yeah, where's, where is it at? Well, Independence Hall. Okay, guys, seriously. Thank you. It's Independence Hall. Now, this is the signing of the Constitution. How do we know that? Because George Washington's there. George Washington didn't sign the Declaration. Why not? Because he was leading the army. So it's been 11 years. They signed the Declaration of Independence, 1776. There are different set of people, but overlapping, 1787 with the Constitution. Why are they there? Because the first Constitution, they think, doesn't work so well. So you can imagine when they were in Philadelphia, in Independence Hall, the same room. You think maybe they were thinking, Oh, how many times are we going to have to come here again before we get it right? You know, when we talk about a more perfect union, it's because they already had experience with a union they didn't think worked. And what we're going to learn is that there were some people and some things that they left out. Now, when we talk about the people who were left out of the original Constitution, who are we talking about? Definitely talking about me. Women, talking about you, there you go, there you go. And what we're going to talk about today through the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment is how we fix the things that got left out. George Washington himself said the Constitution's not perfect. The Constitution's not perfect, but there's an amendment process that makes it perfect. What's the first thing that we get through the amendment process? What are the first 10 amendments? The Bill of Rights, exactly. <laughs> it's okay, I don't mind shout outs as long as they're on point. <laughs> okay, so this is the Bill of Rights. So we start out right away, we've got a constitution, and before we can even get it ratified, that means the states have to approve it, okay? Before we can even get it ratified, the states, many of them, including my state of North Carolina. I just came from New Bern. You may have read about that with the flooding, but I thought you guys were so important, I had to make it here. So North Carolina was a state that says, we're not even gonna ratify the, bill of, the Constitution without a Bill of Rights. So they get one. <clears throat> Who's the principal author of the Bill of Rights? Who's this guy? James, Ma James Madison is my boyfriend. And I don't want to hear anybody talk about Alexander Hamilton. I mean, he's okay, but Madison is my favorite founder. And here's part of why. Because at the beginning, he didn't think we needed a Bill of Rights. He didn't think we needed a Bill of Rights. And yet when he runs for Congress from Virginia, the voters there convince him that if he wants to be elected to Congress, he better support a Bill of Rights. So when the new Congress under the new Constitution starts, he supports a Bill of Rights even though he'd initially opposed it. And the reason he gives is, I am an honest man. Meaning, 
He made a promise, a political promise to his constituents, and he was intending to keep it. You think that's pretty common for a lot of politicians these days? No, in fact, many Americans think the big problem is our, our people that we elect don't keep their promises to us. Well, Madison did. And a nauseous project is what he called the Bill of Rights. Can you believe that? He called the Bill of Rights a nauseous project because he was trying to get it through Congress and get it passed. Congress didn't want to do it. Congress didn't want to do it. Congress wanted to pass a tax bill. And yes, they needed the money, but they, they weren't addressing the Bill of Rights. So guess what happens? In Virginia and New York, which are big states, you got to have Virginia and New York to have the Constitution work. They're saying, and this is just a matter of months, they're saying, oh, see, we knew you weren't going to do a Bill of Rights. We're going to start a whole new Constitutional Convention. This is in 1789. The Constitution just went into effect in March. Madison's trying to get the Bill of Rights through. And then in June, Virginia and New York are saying, oh, well, you know, we knew you weren't going to do it. We're going to do another Constitutional Convention. What do you think might have happened there? If you can't get, let's see, we're already on number two. We could have got number three, and then who knows when you stop after that. Right now, our Constitution is the oldest written Constitution of a nation still in effect. Now, I'm going to show you some of the things Madison had to deal with. <clears throat> now, if you were, this is the person who was responsible for taking the notes while the Bill of Rights was being debated. Now, if your teacher, if you were out sick for a few days, days your teacher said you're going to have a pop test, is this the person's notes you'd want to use? No, no. I mean, he's good at a cowboy and a horse. Um, <coughs> but, so when we're talking about the framers' intent and the language in the Bill of Rights, we just have to remember that often we're relying on note-takers. And sometimes the note takers weren't very good. This is why the Bill of Rights is being debated. So what eventually comes out, that's the document that was the original Bill of Rights. Now it has 12 amendments. How many amendments got approved? Yeah, it's okay to, if you know the right answer, it's okay to call it out, okay? And we're, we're moving a little fast. So 10, Except there's one, 10 of the 12, what happens to another one? Do you know the answer? It gets ratified in 1992 and becomes the 27th Amendment. So, yes, did you have a question? No, okay, okay. Um, so, and so there's one still out there from the original Bill of Rights that's still kind of floating out there. And if it were approved, we'd have 5,000 members of Congress. Yeah, that's, it had a population proportion for who, uh, how many people had to be represented in Congress. Now, when we go through the amendments themselves, we all think of the First Amendment, right? Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press. Those have to be the most important rights because they're the First Amendment, right? except it wouldn't have been the First Amendment. If the first two that didn't get ratified had been ratified, that would be your Third Amendment. So it sounds kind of funny, right? Your Third Amendment right to free speech. It really doesn't sound quite as promising. Now let's look at some of those rights and the principles behind them that were upheld. Has anybody ever seen this picture before? It's one that's in your book that you'll receive. Can you guess where these students might have been giving that salute? Yes, sir? Exactly. You think Germany, wouldn't you? Anybody else think different than Germany? Yes, sir. America. This was in Connecticut. And, and guys, please, can you keep down the whispering and stuff like that? 
my, uh, it's, it's hard to hear what's going on, so thanks. This is in Connecticut. In 1939, that was considered the appropriate salute to the flag. You'd say, I pledge allegiance, and then do that to the flag. And there were some kids who were Jehovah's Witnesses, a religious minority at the time, that said, wait a minute. That's like saluting a graven God. That's idolatry to us. We don't think we should have to do that. In school, where we're, where we're compelled by law to go to school, and the first time that case, and, and they pointed out, by the way, they were getting discriminated against in Nazi Germany for refusing to give that same salute. And what happened was the first time the case came in 1939, the Supreme Court said, sorry, patriotism's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with making you show some patriotism, particularly when you're in school. Four years later, it's the, one of the quickest reversals ever in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decides just the opposite. What do you think has happened in that time? Yes. And what they started to realize is, wait a minute, and this, this judge, Justice Robert Jackson, who gives in 1943 this opinion, will go on to prosecute some of the Nazi war criminals. And what he says here, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, Na uh, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. So when you look at the First Amendment, that first part of the Bill of Rights that most people consider the most important, here's the core principle. We don't want the government to tell you what you have to believe in terms of your religion. We don't want the government to tell you what you have to believe in terms of your country. That, he goes on to say, we believe in voluntary patriotism. And we think that anybody who has to be forced to be patriotic, that's not even worthy of the word patriotism. So that's why it's an established principle that uh, school children do not have to say the Pledge of Allegiance. It's because our ideas of patriotism are more important than one particular sentence. Has anybody ever heard of this guy, Simon Tam? Okay, well, maybe, maybe he's old. He's in his late 20s, so he's probably too old for you guys. But anyway, he had his own band, and it was called The Slants. He's Asian American. He wanted to have a band called The Slants, even though many Asian Americans think that's a derogatory term would not like to have it used uh, regarding them. And yet he said, wait a minute, this is what I want to call my band. I'm taking that negative and turn it into an empowerment for me. And he had a band, so he needed to get a trademark, because otherwise he couldn't get a recording contract. And what he spends 10 years before the Patent and Trademark Office that keep telling him, no, you can't patent that name because it's offensive to Asian Americans. And he says, wait a minute, I'm an Asian American. Why can't I patent it? And then he went on to say that word, there's nothing intrinsic to that word that has to be a racial slur. You can have a slant aid engine. There were slants were used in other contexts. And he said, I began to think the only person that couldn't use the word slant was an Asian American. So he goes on 10 years, gets to the Supreme Court, and guess what? He wins. And guess what? It's 9 to 0, unanimous. I mean, for people that are in the uh, law, you know, to get a 9 to 0 appeal of the Supreme Court is pretty hard. And here's the principle. It's not that that word is good. It's not that that word is good when used against an Asian American. It's not going to be hurtful. It's that there's some things we don't want the government deciding. 
And if this is a young man who's Asian American and wants to use that as name of a band, the government can't decide whether it's good or bad. Now you as a consumer can decide whether it's good or bad, but we're not gonna let the government make that choice. That's a basic First Amendment principle. Similarly, you'll hear often freedom for the thought we hate. This is a demonstration over to the right at a military funeral. Someone who's killed in action in <clears throat> Iraq or Afghanistan. And there was a particular church group that believed that all the deaths in the Iraq or Afghanistan war or the United States were a punishment from God because they accepted um, LGBTQ people in the army. And they would show up at every funeral. And the gentleman who brought this case, it was his son who had given his life for our country. And he didn't want there to be petitions with curses of God on his family and his country. And so he went to court and said, wait a minute, they shouldn't be allowed to do this. And what the court said is, sorry, it's a public sidewalk. And yeah, they have the right to protest, even though we don't like what they have to say. That's another First Amendment principle. But guess what happened? Guess what happened? And this is what goes back to our power as citizens. You see those men in uniform lined up there? You see the other people on the sidewalk? That's a citizens committee. And they protected this demonstrations way over there. They lined up so that family never had to see that demonstration. So it's another example of what we as citizens can do even when people that we disagree with are protected under the Constitution. Now, you've heard about the Second Amendment rights. The thing that I want, I'm just kind of quickly going through some of these rights for you. The thing you want to remember is no right in the Bill of Rights is unlimited. Every right has limits. So when people talk about Second Amendment rights, the thing you want to remember is whether it's an individual right as the Supreme Court has ruled or not, it still has limits. And what our country is debating now is what those limits should be. The other thing you want to know about the Bill of Rights is most of it applies to when you get in trouble with the law. Why do you think that is? Because the framers themselves have been in trouble with the law. So a good half of the Bill of Rights is about that. Then you have this gentleman. Has anybody ever heard of this gentleman before? Clarence Earl Gideon? Do you think you have a right to a lawyer if you get arrested? Yeah, yeah, because you've heard it on TV, right? Yeah. Well, this is the guy. This was the guy who helped establish that right. From prison, when he was tried in Florida in the 1960s, you didn't have a right to a lawyer at the state level unless it was a capital crime, unless you were going to be die. But you could be sent to prison, not have a right to a lawyer. And he writes that handwritten petition from prison, and the Supreme Court will eventually say, yes, we want a right to a lawyer, not just when you uh, could be killed, but also when you could be sent to prison. Okay, deep breath. We're really at the seventh inning stretch. Here we go. Who knows who this man is? You can read the slide, right? This gentleman, Dred Scott, why is he important? And why when we're talking about rights and we're going to be going to the 14th Amendment, is he important? Because it, anybody, this, anybody want to raise a hand on that? Okay, yeah? No? Okay. This gentleman was born in Virginia enslaved. Why was he enslaved at birth? Yes, sir. Can, can you speak up? So you're, being, you're on national television. Speak up. And, because, hold on just a second. I want to make sure I, I understand your point correctly. He was an African American and the law at that time in Virginia, this is what we need to understand. These things didn't just 
naturally happen. It was the law that made them happen. And Virginia is the first colony, and the United States becomes the first country where the condition of your mother determines your condition in terms of your freedom. So if your mother is enslaved, you are born a slave. That is something unique that happens in America in Virginia in the 1600s. So he could have been African American and free in any other normal number of states, including Virginia. But the reason he was born a slave was because his mother was enslaved and Virginia law upheld that. He goes to the Supreme Court, tries to get freedom for himself and his whole family. It's his wife and his two daughters. And his two daughters are 11 and 12. And um, they could be sold away. And it's his wife who is living in St. Louis, gets together with her pastor, and helps really push the case. It comes before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, in what is regarded as the worst opinion that the Supreme Court ever gives, that not only is Mr. Scott still enslaved and his family still enslaved, it goes on to say that no African American free or enslaved, can ever be a citizen of the United States. Now, the dissent points out, wait a minute, what are you talking about? North Carolina, where I'm from? Yes, there were free people of color who could vote because they had property. In New Jersey, there were free people of color and women who could vote who had property. Check out that dissent. But that became the law of the land, and many people believe that that's what preempt or started the Civil War, because then there was no way that a state on its own could ever decide, yes, we're going to be free or enslaved, because if, if and it, that applied to African Americans all over the country, whether they lived in Massachusetts or Georgia. That was how radical that decision was. So what does it do? It means that ultimately a civil war is going to be highly likely in comms. And at the end of that war, you have four million people, four million people who have previously been enslaved. What is going to be their status? Because we talk about the 13th Amendment that quote unquote freed the slaves, we'll learn that slavery in terms of labor contracts, et cetera, was going on through World War II, particularly in the Deep South. But the 13th Amendment says slavery is going to be unconstitutional. Then what happens to, the, to those people? Do you think Mississippi, my home state, is like real excited that, OK, what, what, what's going to happen to former slaves there? Yes, sir. They seceded. Before that, to yeah, we're, we're right now. We're, we're we've sorry. I'm I'm going real quick with you. I know it's kind of a we're going warp speed. But we've had the Civil War. The Civil War's over. We got the Thirteenth Amendment that says the slaves are free. But what's their status? Are they citizens? One just a second. Let me get yes, sir. And then I want some girls to put up some hands, ladies. Yes, yes. Wait, can you speak up? They're still, they're they are there. You're right. They're, they're technically free. They're not citizens because then citizenship is determined by the state. And what happens in the 14th Amendment is that it defines citizenship. These are some of the African, this is a reenactment of some of the African Americans that become soldiers. This is the thing you need to know about the 14th Amendment. It's for the first time we get a notion of equality. You know, you think you might have a right to be free from discrimination? Not before the 14th Amendment. Not before the 14th Amendment. In fact, the 14th Amendment is so important. It covers so many things 
that Ken Burns, the TV producer, has said it's like the Grand Canyon. You've got the Constitution before the 14th Amendment, and then you've got the 14th Amendment. And in fact, if, if anybody asks you how your rights are protected, just say 14th Amendment. It covers it all. It covers all the Bill of Rights. It covers, um, <clears throat> it also covers the freedom from discrimination. I told you it defines citizenship at both the state and federal level. It makes the Bill of Rights apply to the states. And then here's the one you're most familiar with, equal protection. Equal protection. Everybody should have equal protection under the law. That means you shouldn't be discriminated against on race or on gender. Um, we're going to look at how that has been imperfectly enforced, but that's where the principle comes from. Who recognizes that photo of those children? Yes, ma'am. I can't hear you, darling. Well, let's take a look. Let's figure it out, okay? These are children. I'm guessing that they're Asian American children. Let's see if we can make a guess about the date. We, we know anybody else? Have, okay, you in the back, and then I'll get to you. Yes, sir. We're guessing because of the photographs. Someone over here. Yes, sir. This is exactly what, I, that was perfect. The answer is no, they weren't. But they weren't immigrants. No. Why did I say that was the perfect answer? Because those are the way, the, the way we tend to look at pictures like that. No, these are children who were born in America. They're native born under the 14th Amendment, native born American citizens. Who else had a comment? I'm trying to get somebody, yes, what did you say? Here's one last comment and then we'll see. And by the way, I, don't, I didn't expect you to know the right answer. I'm glad you gave that answer because a lot of people would make that guess. Go ahead. Have you heard of that before? You've heard of internment of Japanese Americans during World War II? And by the way, at the time, there were, there were comments made that, oh, well, the, the Army had some evidence of disloyalty. We now know, based on the Supreme Court records, that there was never any evidence of disloyalty. There was only fear. Fear is pretty powerful in terms of hurting people, right? So these are native-born Japanese-American children who, during World War II, are rounded up with their families, taken to horse farms. Some of them have to live in horse stalls. And yet, they think of themselves, and they are loyal American citizens. So we're looking at how equal protection starts out, and we're thinking maybe it's not so equal protection after all, right? Why didn't they protect the Japanese children? Let's look at this. Has anybody ever heard of Barbara Johns? No? Okay, that's okay, because you're going to want to know about Barbara Johns after this. Have you heard of Brown versus Board of Education and desegregating schools, right? And if I were to tell you there was one person, one person who really got that case going, he was the attorney, he was the attorney, but an attorney has to have a case, right? An attorney has to have a case. You can't, Thurgood Marshall can't just go to the Supreme Court and say, Your Honor, this is bad. We've got to do something about this. No. You have to have a case to come up. You have to have pointus. This young woman, this is the Virginia Civil Rights Monument now. This young woman, Barbara Johns, she said it seemed like reaching for the moon. You know what she did in her high school? 
It was a segregated high school that had very poor facilities. She was trying to protest that. And yet she knew her teachers couldn't really do anything about it. Why? Why couldn't her teachers do anything about it? Yes. They would get fired and they were African American. They were being discriminated against. Even teachers today, guess what, can get fired. And so what she did was she organized a student strike at an African American school, segregated school in the Deep South. And she was the first one of those that then becomes the cases that come to Brown. And you've never heard of her before, have you? Yeah, fix that, okay? These are the stories when we think about people, and yes, it was Thurgood Marshall, but it was also Barbara Johns. Okay, who's this lady? Ruben Ginsburg. Excuse me, the notorious RBG. And she did the intro to my book, so I'm very proud. Now, she, as a lawyer, helped rights for women and also men, as Thurgood Marshall did for African Americans, although she will say, you know, she never had to worry about being killed the way he did. But if you were back, back in the 1970s, if you were a female officer, um, your spouse could not get base housing. Males could, but females couldn't. If you were a man whose wife died, you couldn't get a spouse benefit to help stay at home and raise your child, but a woman could. And if you were a man, you couldn't drink until age 21, but a woman could at 18. So she fixed all of that and said, we've got to have equality for everybody. And that includes race. Now, you've heard about the Equal Rights Amendment. That's one of those amendments that hasn't passed. There are people out there now that are trying to get that added to the Constitution. And then LGBTQ rights. This is the most recent uh, addition under the Constitution. The idea was that there have always been LGBTQ citizens in our nation. And shouldn't they have equality under the law? And most recently, what the Supreme Court ruled is that marriage, to the extent that it's created by the state, now this doesn't, okay, thank you, to the extent that it's created by the state, doesn't say that any church has to recognize any particular definition of marriage other than is in their church. But as a legal matter, if you're going to say that your spouse can inherit your property without having to pay taxes or can come visit you in the hospital or you can have children together, etc., adopt, that the law should treat all citizens equally. And what the Supreme Court said most recently is that marriage is a similar institution where there should be a norm of equality for all people. And they based that on the decision in the 60s where it was illegal to marry somebody of a different race. So here's my wind up. One big So why should you care about any of this, besides its Constitution Day and your own national television? Now, this is rhetorical at this point. Here's why you should care about it. Remember what I said? Remember when I was showing you the pictures of the kids during World War II and the salutes that they were being forced to give? Uh, by the way, what I didn't tell you was that there was so much animosity against Jehovah's Witness at that time that there was a mob for refusing to say the pledge to the flag, that there was a mob attack in Nebraska and they castrated a Jehovah's Witness man. This is how serious these issues can be. But what does Judge Hand, he's writing during World War II, and what does he say? I'm showing you the Supreme Court because we think the Supreme Court's in charge of our rights, right? 
But here's what George Hand said during World War II. Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women, and when it dies there, no law, no court, no constitution can save it. That means it's up to us. That means it's up to us. And today that means it's up to you. Thanks for listening.